Okay, so in this video, what I'm going to do is walk you through the first 15 of the items that are listed from my study packet for art and the academic team. So when I begin my PowerPoint, I decided to start with the ancient Egyptians and the architecture of the pyramids. And it started out with the pyramids, as you can see here, with a step style instead of the smooth pyramid that we usually come to associate with the Great Pyramids of Giza. Those there are the three Great Pyramids of Giza, and there they are listed out for the various pharaohs of the Old Kingdom. Remember that Egyptian history, ancient Egyptian history, is divided into the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom, and these are all Old Kingdoms. Uh, essentially, they began as a monument to the dead pharaoh, but essentially functioned as an advertisement to come and essentially uh, plunder. Uh, so as you can see, the largest one is that of Khufu, then you have that of Khafre and Menkure. Uh, of course, when Herodotus talks about these three, and when he had his histories that he had written, the great Greek historian, the father of history, he had Greek names for them, like, for example, Menkure was Mycerinus. Imhotep is understood to be the architect of the pyramid design, but again, they abandoned that uh, because it was just simply too irresistible for tomb raiders and the like. Uh, for whatever reason, I included this slide. This is that of the pharaoh Amenhotep IV, changed his name and all of Egyptian religion to Akhenaten and the exclusive worship of the sun. He is the predecessor, of course, of probably the most famous of all pharaohs, uh, for those that are just aware of it in pop culture, being, of course, King Tut or Tutankhamun, which, speaking of which, was discovered in 1922 by Howard Carter, one of the great archaeological finds in all of history. There again is Djoser's Set Pyramid, and then we move on to ancient Greek architecture as well. You can see I have here the three types of columns, starting at the left with the Doric, which is the most simple of all columns, and you can categorize them by the capital. The capital is the head of the column. Doric is going to be simple. Then you have Ionic, which has the volutes, the little curly cues on either side, like a ram's horn maybe. And then you have Corinthian, named after the city of Corinth, but it is noted for its acanthus leaves, a type of plant all over the Mediterranean. The main section of Athens at this very beginning was the Acropolis, kind of a citadel that you can see right here. And that is, of course, where the most famous of all ancient buildings and temples, the Parthenon, so-called because it is dedicated to Athena, and Athena being a virgin goddess, the Latin, or I should say Greek word for virgin, is Parthenos, and so you can see it uh, that is right here. But this was built during the time of Pericles in the 400s and was a replacement for a previous building on the same site of the Acropolis, which literally means in Greek, Acro, the top, polis, city. So the city's top, and that's what the Acropolis looks like today. You enter in the Propylaea, which is the of course, part that you see these little people walking up here. On your right will be the Parthenon, heavily damaged, obviously, about 200 years ago. And then over here on the left, you can see a building known as the Erechtheum. There's the Parthenon to Athena. The architect was Phidias and built under the great uh, uh, leader Pericles in the 400s BCE. Phidias is famous not only for being the architect of the whole sculptural program of the Parthenon, he is also famous for one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, which, like this statue in the Parthenon of Athena, was Chris Elephantine. I'm speaking, of course, of his... Uh, uh, great Zeus at Olympia, uh, which also, as I said, was Chris Elephantine, meaning that it was made of gold. That's the Chris part in Greek. And then, of course, Elephantine, which is ivory. So this part in his body would have been ivory, his face and whatnot, and he would have had gold drapery all over him. So Phidias, an incredibly, incredibly important and famous Greek sculptor for all of the sculptural program of the Parthenon and one of the seven Ancient Wonders of the World, which is the statue of Zeus at Olympia, which is, of course, no longer with us. By the way, if you wanted to see an exact replica of the Parthenon, you would go to Nashville, Tennessee. It's in a park right next to Vanderbilt. Moving on, so make sure you know Phidias and the two great sculptural monuments he is responsible for. Moving on to Praxiteles. Praxiteles is a Greek sculptor famous for his Hermes with infant Dionysus. You can see in his right arm, arm he has does Hermes, the infant Dionysus, and supposedly with his left arm, he would have been dangling grapes in front of the child, uh, as of course Dionysus is the uh, god of wine, reverie, and grapes, and the like. <laughs> Moving on, you have the next great sculptor, Myron. Myron is famous for Discobolos, 
which of course is the discus thrower, so Myron. Next you have Polycletos, who is famous for the spear bearer or the Deriferous. Uh, this was in some ways known as the canon, as it was recognized as perhaps one of the most model and greatest of all sculptures, because it shows all of the right proportionality. The, of course, contraposto stand that he has in which all of the weight is thrown onto one fit foot over the other. Of course, all of his weight is here. You can tell that this is a Roman copy of a Greek original. Greek originals would have been in bronze, but Roman copies are the ones that survive because they are in marble. You can always tell they have these unsightly little struts all over the place because because the marble's weight in and of itself would not allow the, of course, arm to be able to dangle without breaking off. And so you have all of those struts, but you can always tell that it is a Roman copy of the Greek original. We move on to Roman art and, of course, the Arapacus. This was dedicated by the first emperor of Rome, Augustus, in 12 BC. And, essentially, it was the altar Ara of peace that you can see here. So Augustus and the Arapacus, which recently, within the last 20 years, has been restored and put on display once more in Rome. Now, not to be confused with the Parthenon is a similar sounding building, the Pantheon. The Pantheon is the most well-preserved ancient Roman building temple that we have left, and it is in the Campus Martius of Rome. The Campus Martius is a section of Rome along the Tiber River that originally was meant to be a place for the Roman army to carry out military exercises. Later, it became a somewhat of a theater district with lots of theaters and baths, and of course, the structure here known as the Pantheon. It is a circular temple. Uh, however, the one that we see today was rebuilt by the Emperor Hadrian. However, he left the name of the original builder on the building itself, and you can see it there, Marcus Agrippa Fake it. Latin word fake it means made it. So he made it tertium cos in his third consulship. Consulship is kind of like a term of presidency. And here the LF just tells you that he is the Phileas of Lucius. Uh, and so Marcus Agrippus, the son of Lucius, made it in his third consulship. It is a magnificent building and has a dome that you can see up at the top there with an oculus or an eye that allows air, light, and rain to come in. Here you have, moving on to Byzantine architecture, you're looking at around the year somewhat 500 uh, BC or 580, I should say, or CE. And this is, of course, the building that was built under the Emperor Justinian, known as Hagia Sophia, or the Church of Holy Wisdom. It has now been converted into a mosque, an Islamic mosque, and you can see the minarets, the four minarets of these towers, the place from which the muezzin calls for the prayers uh, at the times of the day in which, obviously, the adherents of the Islamic faith. So Hagia Sophia, it is in Istanbul, which previously had been known as Constantinople, as named by the Emperor Constantine in around the year circa 320. AD, and before that was known as Byzantium, and that's why the empire that grows out of the Eastern Roman Empire becomes known to us as the Byzantine Empire. So let's move ahead into the Renaissance and tackle some of the artists that often come up in Quiz Bowl there. First and foremost, you have to be familiar with Florence. It is the major city that you see here in the region known as Tuscany. And it is a place where banking and a banking family, particularly the Medici, allowed a great patronage of the arts and what Renaissance means, which is a rebirth of tackling the culture of Greece, particularly as is it expressed uh, in the arts, as it were. And so you have just this flowering uh, around circa 1300s, 1400s, and 1500s of the Renaissance. So, so there you can see two famous members of the Medici family. On the left is Cosimo Medici, one of the original founders of the glory days of that family. And then, of course, the great patron of the arts, Lorenzo the Magnificent, uh, who ruled over Florence, like I said, in the 15th and 16th centuries. So let's start with Giotto. According to legend, he was discovered drawing on a rock and was invited to become a painter's assistant. And he led a revolution in painting in which he was able to go from 2D depictions to that of 3D, giving his figures volumes and weight. Giotto is famous for his Lament of Christ that you see there, and it might look somewhat rudimentary to you, but again, it is a great leap forward in the artistic style of the time, giving his figures volume, like I said, and weight. And there you can see the betrayal of Judas. These are inevitably frescoes. A fresco is a term for a artwork that is painted directly onto a wall. And there's his Madonna in Gloria. 
He is also noted in Florence of the architect of the Campanile. It's this giant tower that you can see right next to what is known in Florence as the Duomo, as designed by the great architect Brunelleschi. But here, the Tower of Giotto or the Campanile, and it is incredibly, incredibly tall. And there you can see a great view of both the Florentine Cathedral uh, and, of course, the Tower of Giotto immediately to the left. Now, let's do talk about this Duomo, as it were. First and foremost, it was began built in the either 14th or 15th centuries, the 1300s or 1400s, I cannot remember. But for a good century almost, the building was incomplete as they left a huge hole to where they were looking for a dome to be built. And who stepped forward an unlikely figure in the form of Brunelleschi? He was able to design it with an ingenious dome within a dome design that you can see especially on the right. But what was remarkable about it is that as he approached the leaders of Florence and claimed that he was up to the job, they wanted to know what his design was, they wanted to know what his plan, and he refused. He was not an architect by design. He was a watchmaker, a clockmaker, but he was able to obviously design what is now known as the most iconic figure in all of the Florentine landscape, as it were. So as you can see it there, it was the first time that a dome that size had been built since the Pantheon. And he was actually allowed to cut a piece out of the Pantheon. And there's the interior of the Pantheon, remember, built by the Emperor Hadrian. And it was a rebuild of the original Pantheon by, of course, Marcus Agrippa. And there's a little hole. The Pope allowed him to cut a little hole because he wanted to know how in the world it could be done, this giant dome, without collapsing onto itself. Now we move on to Masakio. Masakio, as you can see, is dates there, 1401 to 1428. And this is a fresco that you can find known as the tribute money. And it's probably the only thing at the high school level that would come up for Masakio as a answer line, be it in a bonus or a toss up. So Masakio and the tribute money. Now we move on to Donatello. Donatello was a sculptor and his David, which you can find in Florence in a museum known as the Borgello, and it's never really uh, visited quite heavily. So if you ever go to Florence, make sure you make a quick visit to the Borgello because it has all kinds of wonderful pieces, including the David. This was the first nude male sculpture since Roman times. So when the rise of Christianity began after the fall of Rome, there was a much greater emphasis upon modesty and not depicting the beauty of the naked human body. And so when he made the David here, it obviously was revolutionary. I like to call this the effeminate David. As you can see, he's got kind of an effeminate pose. He's got long hair and he's got a hat and he is standing, of course, on Goliath's head. And there you can see it up close. The, of course, uh, Donatello's David, or as I like to call it, the effeminate David. There is his, of course, sculpture of St. George. Remember the St. George, the killer of the dragon, is the patron saint of England. And that's why on the, of course, flag of England, you have both the cross of St. George, which you can see is on his shield. And then Andrew was created on a cross, or I should say not created, but Andrew was crucified, St. Andrew, on a cross like an X. And so that's why on the British flag today, you will find both the St. George's cross and the St. Andrew's cross to make what is the flag known as the Union Jack, seeing as Scotland is a part of the United Kingdom. There is his, of course, equestrian statue, Gatamalata. And there is his carving of wood of Mary Magdalene. Again, you can find it in the Bargello. Moving on, there are more things that you need to know for Donatello, but those are the basics that would get you, obviously, most of the toss-ups that would come up. Now we move our attention to Lorenzo Giberti, who is, of course, the uh, or author, or artist or sculptor of the Bronze Doors on the Baptistry in Florence. If you ever travel in Italy or Europe, you will very often find that there is another building outside of a cathedral right next to it that is the Baptistry. That is because when you are born, you are not allowed to enter into the cathedral until you are baptized. And so you have to go into the Baptistry. And then, of course, after the, you are baptized as a little baby, they can take you into the church. Not only is it a famous combo of the Baptistry in Florence right outside of the church that is the Duomo, but if you go to Pisa, the, of course, place where most people go to look for the Leaning Tower of Pisa, there's a great cathedral out in the field there and in front of the baptistry. And that baptistry is the baptistry in which you would find that Galileo was baptized. This baptistry in Florence is where the great author Dante was. And these doors in bronze are revolutionary in showing their perspective. They are what's called bas-relief, B-A-S relief, which indicates that the sculpture comes 3D out of the wall. 
And again, with just perspective and angling and all sorts of other things, it was absolutely amazing. On the Doors, which of course titled The Gates of Paradise, it depicts various different scenes from the Bible. And there you can see the baptistry. If you were standing right here looking at this, immediately to your right would be the giant church that is, of course, the Duomo in Florence. Now we move on to Alessandro or just Sandro Botticelli. From 1445 to 1510, you can see that he obviously is right at the last half of the 15th century. And one of the most asks about paintings in all of Quiz Bowl, The Birth of Venus, that shows, of course, the goddess of love after her immediate birth from the sea foam and being blown ashore by the wind Zephyr and on the island of Cytheria about to be clothed by an awaiting attendant there. So an incredibly, incredibly famous painting, The Birth of Venus. Please make sure you pay attention to the details. As in a toss-up, it would obviously cover those sorts of things. There is a, of course, up close of the person that was the model for this Birth of Venus. And there you can see details of the left-hand side of the painting and moving on. Also, his painting, the Primavera, literally just merely spring. It's an allegorical type painting in which you can see the personification of spring to the right there with the flowery dress uh, there in an orange grove. And you have the three graces in their sheer gowns dancing on the left-hand side. This painting, as well as the last one, the Birth of Venus, can be found in the Uffizi in Florence. Uh, Uffizi is a term that in Italian literally means the offices, and they were the personal... Uh, um, apartments of the Medici family, but now along the Arno River in Florence, the Arno, they are now converted into one of the best museums in all of Europe for when it comes to painting, and I would argue maybe the best when it comes to actually Renaissance painting there in his room, the Botticelli room. But there you can see, obviously, the graces in La Primavera, and there is, of course, the personification of spring herself. I have heard, but I do not quite remember the details, that one of these people, maybe the Venus of the birth of Venus, or maybe this one, was modeled upon Simonetta Vespucci, the sister of Armerigo Vespucci, who is, of course, responsible for the naming of the continent. This is my favorite Botticelli painting, The Adoration of the Magi, and the reason I like it so much is not because you can see Cosimo de' Medici here or Lorenzo the Magnificent de' Medici there, but rather because you have Botticelli on the right-hand side staring directly at the viewer. And so there is the artist himself. Here is his Venus and Mars, depicting obviously the mythological story of Venus cheating on her husband Vulcan, the ugly god of the forge, with of course the god of war Mars. And there it is, I just talked about it, the Uffizi, where, of course, you can find all of these great paintings. We move on to the Northern Renaissance, up to the modern-day part of the Netherlands, Holland. And this is, of course, Jan van Eyck. He has, along with the Birth of Venus uh, of Baracelli's, another painting that is asked about a lot when it comes to... Uh, Quizbowl, and that would be, of course, the Arnolfini marriage. You can always have, count on in a toss-up, it talking about some fruit on the windowsill, some uh, empty shoes on the left-hand side, the symbol of fidelity, which is the dog, and so forth and so on. And if you look closely in the back there, he actually signs it, Jan van Eyck, and there's a mirror that shows, obviously, the scene from the other side. Here is the Ghent altarpiece, which, of course, he does as a triptych. A triptych, uh, as a part of a decoration for an altar, is so called because it'll have three panels that can fold in. And you can see this part over here on the left, and the part over the right would fold in, covering what you have there. And he does this with, of course, his brother Hubert, Hubert van Eyck. Now, we move on to Pope Julius II. Uh, he was the Pope immediately following Alexander VI, and he was known as the bully to the artists. He was quite the patron, but he would also force the artists, whomever they might be, to create whatever he saw fit as his desires of the art to be produced. Uh, now, we will come back to him with a couple of artists. We only have a couple of more for our first 14, or 15, I should say. Of course, perhaps uh, to the common person out in the street, the most famous of all Renaissance artists, Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci was apprenticed to Andrea Verrocchio, sculptor of a David himself. I like to call it the cheerleader David. There are four Davids that I like to talk about when it comes to art, especially as it comes up in Quiz Bowl. You have the Donatello David, which I say is the effeminate one. The cheerleader David, because he just looks like a... a, a 70s cheerleader. That, of course, is Verrocchio's. Then you will have, of course, Michelangelo's David, and then finally, of course, Bernini's David. But at any rate, uh, that is Verrocchio's, to whom Leonardo da Vinci was apprenticed. Now, 
This is the story concerning this painting in which it's the baptism of Christ. Down at the bottom left, it was uh, given to Leonardo, who's apprentice, to paint these two little angels, as well as some of the background. Verrocchio was so overwhelmed of how much better Leonardo was than anybody else, including himself, that he vowed he would never pick up a brush again. He was just, it, he realized he was not in Leonardo's league. And there is the detail of Leonardo's angel. We have the Annunciation, which is in the Uffizi, a famous moment in the New Testament for Christianity. And there's the detail. And now we have then the northern part of Italy, Milan, where, of course, under the patronage of the Sforza family, the ruling family of Milan, Leonardo was able to, of course, create many works, including perhaps the most famous of those works we'll get to in a moment, which is, of course, the La Gioconda, known as the Mona Lisa. This is his famous works of the Madonna of the Rocks. One is in London, the other is in the Louvre in Paris, and it's featured is this painting in the, of course, Da Vinci Code. Uh, you can see they look rather similar, but they are somewhat different with some of the details, like on the right-hand side, you can see the cross and the halo is just not, of course, going to be on the left-hand side, and some of the figures are a little bit different as well. And of course, the rocks in the background give the name itself to the painting. There is Madonna and Child with Saint Anne. There you are. And of course, in Milan, which of course you can see right there in Northern Italy is the Last Supper. If I ever travel to Milan, it'll be one of the main reasons, if not the only reason as to why I would go. It's painted on a wall, so it's a fresco. And there was in the last 50 years, great concern about its deterioration, but it seems as though they have got some sort of restoration underway. And La Gioconda, the Mona Lisa. It's a rather small painting, smaller than you would think. And of course, it was worked on almost every single day of Leonardo's life. And he kept it under his bed whenever he was traveling or whenever he was moving about. And he worked on it a lot. And there's the enigmatic smile of the Mona Lisa. You can find it in the Louvre, the famous, famous art museum in Paris. We move on to Michelangelo, uh, Michelangelo Buonarroti, a genius sculptor. And he saw himself foremost as a sculptor, even though he is perhaps as famous as a painter. His first work of note is done by him when he was 25 years old, and he signed it. So you can see the Pietà. Pietà is the term of an art that shows a dying or dead Christ in the arms of Mary. And it is in St. Peter's Basilica, the huge church that you find in Rome, the Vatican. And he signs his name right there on the sash. You have his Moses, Pope Julius II, that bully pope that we talked about earlier. He's also known as the warrior pope because he fought a lot of wars, leading the Vatican as a political entity against others, is that he had this huge tomb in mind, but it would have been impossible to complete because he had overplanned 200 sculptural figures. And so this is one of the few that actually was made. Note he has horns due to a mistranslation of the Bible, and it shows, of course, Moses as it was for the tomb of Poop. Pope Julius II. There, of course, is his most famous work, the David. It is over 14 feet tall. It is in a museum called the Academia, and it is magnificent. It shows David, who is supposed to be in the Bible version of the story, a 14-year-old boy, but this is no 14-year-old boy. This is a mirror in some ways of Florence, and the Florence that is fully developed, that is fully confident. And here you can see him after the slaying of the giant Goliath and his piercing stare that he has. And the right hand is over large because it shows the right hand of God guiding Florence to its prosperity. It is just a fantastic, fantastic work of art and one of, if not the most iconic works of art of the entirety of the Renaissance. So here in the Uffizi is his only freestanding painting. It's called Holy Family with Infant John the Baptist. So the Holy Family, because it's the parents of Christ, you have Joseph and Mary, but instead of the Christ, you have John the Baptist that they are holding in their arms. And of course, his most famous painting is that of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Pope Julius II, again, bullied him into doing it. And for years on end, that is, of course, his life's work that you have. Later on, he, after the completion of the Great Ceiling, and of course, the centerpiece therein is the creation, the creation of Adam. You see Adam holding out his left hand to have life breathed into him via the finger of God. And there it is, the creation on the ceiling. It's the centerpiece that you see there. Is that he has, later on in his life, he paints the back wall. So just so you can see it here, that is the altar. And right behind the altar is the Last Judgment. Now, the Last Judgment is in a new style that is developing out of the Renaissance called Mannerism. And the next author, Raphael, is going to be the last one of the first 15. And he 
because of his movement into mannerism, is going to, a couple hundred years later, spark a new art movement called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, who want to, of course, depict things that was before Raphael came along with mannerism. But with Michelangelo's Last Judgment, we could see that mannerism, which is going to be noted mannerism for its elongated figures. At any rate, it shows the moment of, as it says, the Last Judgment, and where people are being decided with Christ as the judge. You can see a Apollo like figure in the middle here, of sending people either to hell due to their lives that they have lived, or obviously off to heaven. It is a magnificent piece, but one that is wrought with all kinds of psychology, because as you can see here, and what I'm about to show you in detail is that right there, is that Michelangelo, suffering from mental illness, depicted his own self as a condemned soul, and it shows the skin of his body, obviously, taken from his muscles and bones. Nevertheless, uh, the Sistine Chapel is an offshoot, a little chapel off of the Basilica of St. Peter's, uh, St. Peter being, of course, the first pope, and it is the greatest church in the world and designed by Michelangelo. Later, it was Bramante as the chief architect who, of course, completed it. And there you can see the huge, huge church, which is St. Peter's Basilica. And over here, right there, is the Sistine Chapel, which I said is right off to the side of it. So, in the front of St. Peter's Basilica in the Piazza, which of course was designed in the 1600s by Bernini, whom we'll get to in another installment, is of course a great obelisk, which if I'm mistaken or not mistaken, was originally on the Spina or the barrier in the middle of the Circus Maximus, which of course was the chariot racing area of ancient Rome. And there you can see it, uh, the dome was greater than that of the Duomo when it was finally completed and became the greatest dome in all of Europe. Now, our last one, the first 15, is Raphael Santi, a genius with the brush, it says here. And, of course, you can find his perhaps most famous painting, the School of Athens, in the Vatican Museums. It was originally in the original private apartments of the Pope, but it shows, as you can see in the center figures right there, Aristotle on the right, uh, and of course on the left, that being Plato, the two great Greek philosophers. Uh, Plato points up to the divine, whereas Aristotle holds out the calm hand of reason. There are all kinds of things all over the place. You have a morose philosopher sitting there that is actually modeled on Michelangelo. Uh, and there on the right-hand side is Raphael himself, his own self-portrait peering at the reader, and so forth and so on. You can read this, that Raphael got Bramante, St. Peter's architect, let him see the Sistine Chapel before Michelangelo had finished it, and he copied the pose of Adam, that figure on the foreground, just sitting on the steps. And if we go back and look at the whole painting, and there you can see him, he's kind of off by himself uh, right there. But all over the places, lots and lots of symbolism. It always likes to bring up on the left-hand side, you have in this barrel arches, the, of course, God Apollo, and on the right you have, I think, God, either Athena or Dionysus, I can't be sure which one, but all the time this, of course, asked about in Quiz Bowl. And his great painting, The Transfiguration, here you can see that true mannerist style starting to, of course, manifest itself. And there you can see, as I talked about it, with the uh, mannerism movement that comes out of the late Renaissance, uh, elongated figures. And El Greco, another author that we will meet coming up in the next installment, uh, was very much in that same mannerist style. His next painting that we have for Raphael is the Madonna of the Goldfinch that you can see there. And you have the Sistine Madonna, which those angels at the bottom you very often see in all kinds of pop. Not pop art in the movement, but when you go to some place uh, that has, you know, like stuff to decorate your house, you'll see often those angels that is there. Final thing on Raphael is that he is buried in the Pantheon. The Pantheon, that great ancient building, and here you can see much better the Oculus and the dome that is there, um, is where lots of famous Italians are allowed to be buried. Paris has its own Pantheon that also is housing some of its greatest uh, citizens of France, whereas, of course, for the Pantheon in Rome, Italy, it is for them, the Italian citizens that you see there. So that's it for our first installment. Uh, hopefully uh, you did not mind too much the great length. I know this was 30 minutes, but uh, usually the first one is going to be the longest one. So uh, the next one will be much shorter and you can always watch it on a sped up speed. Thanks.